And so we're, I do want to go ahead and introduce Dr. Asasi. So Dr. Asasi will be um, our next speaker and very excited to hear from him. He's going to speak about um, the, let me just go right back and get the title right, Lung Involvement in Systemic Sclerosis, the Manifestations of the Disease, the Diagnosis, and Symptoms. And so Dr. Asasi is Director of the Division of Rheumatology at UT Health Science Center in Houston and a co-director of the Scleroderma Program at the McGovern uh, Medical School. So we just uh, really are excited about having him here with us today and want to make sure that you guys get to hear. He's also involved in clinical care and research for scleroderma and holds adjunct appointments with the School of Biomedical Informatics, Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences. And we are extremely privileged that he sees clinics at the UT Professional Building in Houston. I know a lot of people that see him and absolutely love Dr. Asasi as their doctor. So Dr. Asasi, I'm just gonna flip over and open you back up. I'm gonna turn on your webcam, make you the first, make you the presenter. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Dr. Asasi. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the uh, pres uh, for the introduction. It's really a great pleasure and privilege uh, to talk uh, to this community. I, I feel like uh, the Skardama community is my, my second family. Uh, I have been spending a long time to understand this disease and help patients with uh, Skardama, I, actually exactly 15 years. Um, so, and especially, it's close to my heart to talk to my patients uh, in the uh, Blue Bonnet chapter, uh, where the vast majority of my patients come from. Um, and I'm, I'm really uh, grateful uh, for the partnership with Scardamo Foundation. Um, they do a tremendous job helping patients with this rare disease. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's hard to have a rare disease. You can feel very lonely. And I think uh, Scaremo Foundation is doing a marvelous job uh, connecting the dots, uh, creating a community of patients uh, who can help each other get better and find the medical care they need. Um, my topic today is lung involvement in scaredema. And I will be providing a brief overview on scaredema, just three slides. I know that uh, Dr. Mays already talked on this topic. Um, then I will be talking about diagnosis and monitoring of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, and the third part is, is going to be the diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Um, the treatment uh, is not my topic. There's a, uh, uh, another talk on the treatment of these conditions. So I will be focusing on diagnosis and screening. So there are two types of scardama. One is localized. Uh, basically, the disease is confined to skin and subcutaneous fat tissue. No internal organ involvement. Typically, patients with localized scardama or morphia are seen by dermatologists. There is another type of scardama called systemic sclerosis or systemic scleroderma, uh, where there is internal organ involvement. The, that is subdivided into limited and diffuse. Uh, and uh, both of limited and diffuse can have lung involvement. And uh, typically patients with systemic sclerosis or systemic scardema are seen in rheumatology clinic. For the rest of the talk, when I mention scleroderma, I mean systemic scleroderma or systemic sclerosis. So I won't be talking about morphia today. As you know, scardama or systemic scardama is subdivided into limited versus diffuse. And that's purely based on the extent of skin involvement. So if the skin involvement is confined to hands, forearms, face, and, and uh, leg further away from the knee, so what you can see On this part, uh, basically these areas, then the patient has limited involvement. And the disease usually always starts in the fingers and toes. 
But if it starts in the fingers and toes and works itself up, goes beyond the elbows and knees, then this area is also affected. Then we have diffuse involvement. Few words on epidemiology of systemic sclerosis. Patients with uh, systemic scleroderma are actually living longer. Uh, this is good news. Uh, and I think this is because of better care, better treatments, but they are still having a lower life expectancy than their age, ethnicity, and gender matched uh, controls or general population. So the cause of death in scleroderma patients has changed. It used to be kidney disease, but now we can treat kidney disease with um, ACE inhibitors such as enalapril, lisinopril. So the kidney disease is not the number one cause of disease-related death. It's lung involvement. However, it's really important to note that lung involvement can have a highly variable course. Um, many patients have mild lung involvement and will not have progressive disease. But there are also patients who will have rapidly progressive disease. Few words are autoantibodies, which is the, the, the blood test that often uh, leads to the diagnosis of scleroderma. There is something called ANA, which is anti-nuclear antibodies. 95% of scleroderma patients have a positive ANA. There's 5% that doesn't have it. But ANA is just a screening test. It's like a positive mammogram. Doesn't prove the presence of scleroderma or any autoimmune disease. In fact, five to ten percent of general population has a positive ANA. ANA is just a screening test. It's the first step. There are follow-up antibodies. They are like the children of ANA. Uh, some of them are very specific for scleroderma. There's the anti-topo isomerase. One, the other name for it is SCL70. Uh, the other one is anti RNA polymerase 3. The other one is anti centromere. Each of them are present in around 20% of scleroderma patients. There are some false positive with anti topo isomerase uh, 1 or SCL70 where the patients are healthy but have this positive test. But that's a problem of testing method rather than the antibody itself. Um, but in general, these antibodies are specific for scleroderma. So these are things you need to remember with SCL70. It's associated with diffuse skin involvement and associated with lung fibrosis, which is my topic today. Anti-RNA polymerase 3 associated with diffuse skin involvement. Usually they don't have severe lung fibrosis but is associated with risk of scleroderma renal crisis, which is the disease that is associated with really high blood pressure and rapidly progressive kidney involvement. So people with, uh, with these antibodies should be monitoring their blood pressures. And if it increases, they need to uh, notify their physician. Antisentromere is associated with limited skin involvement. Sometimes around a, a subgroup of patients with antisentromere, if they have long-standing disease, they develop uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension. I'm going to present two cases. The first case is a typical pulmonary fibrosis case. Um, the second case is a typical pulmonary arterial hypertension case. So pulmonary fibrosis case is the one that I'm presenting. 45-year-old man with six months history of Raynaud's phenomenon, bilateral puffy hands subsequently developing skin thickening, starting at the fingers, which is very typical, but extending itself up to chest. So it's going above the elbows, and uh, so it's affecting also the upper arms. Patient has joint pain, which is common early on in the course of disease, has acid reflux. Again, 90% of scleroma patients have acid reflux. Starting to have shortness of breath on exertion, is on uh, pantoprazole for acid reflux. Has, has dry cough. Dry cough is a very typical symptom of pulmonary fibrosis, but it can be also associated with acid reflux. 
So not all trichoffin scardama is equal pulmonary fibrosis. When I listened to the lungs, lungs were clear, patient had puffy hands, and there was skin thickening over hands that had worked itself up to arms, chest, face, legs, and feet. Um, Antitopa isomerase positivity was present, and patient had ground glass opacity and high resolution chest CT. What type of scardema does this patient have? Has basic skin involvement that goes above the elbows and is affecting the chest. So the patient has diffuse systemic sclerosis. What type of lung disease does the patient have? Is early on, the patient just was diagnosed with scardema, but has ground glass opacity on, on high resolution chest CT, has dry cough, has shortness of breath on exertion. So this person has pulmonary fibrosis. The other name for pulmonary fibrosis is interstitial lung disease. You hear the abbreviation ILV, stands for interstitial lung disease. What is that? So pulmonary fibrosis is hardening of air sacs in the lung that send oxygen to the blood. So impairment of lung function because the gas exchange doesn't work leads to shortness of breath during exercise. And it can also lead to dry cough, a dry nagging cough. When doctors listen to the lung, they might hear, but also might not hear, it's not sensitive. Um, crackles in the lower lung fields. Imaging might be abnormal on chest X-ray, but the better test is high-resolution chest CT. And, and the way lung volumes are assessed, doctors order a test called pulmonary function test, uh, which is a pretty difficult test to do because you have to take a deep breath and blow all the air out as fast as you can. Uh, and um, keep a uh, tight seal around that pipe that you're uh, blowing the air out through. So this is a uh, schematic view of the air sac that is affected by pulmonary fibrosis. So this is the air sac, the alveoli uh, in the lung. When you take a deep breath or each time you take a breath, the, the air goes through the bronchi to alveolar to these air sacs to, and then what happens, the oxygen goes from the air sacs into the blood vessels. These are red blood cells. And the red blood cells absorb the oxygen. Typically, this wall is super thin, uh, super, super thin very, very thin wall, so that the, ex the air exchange happens easily between the air sac space and the vessel space. Usually, it's just very, very thin. What happens in scardama if there's pulmonary fibrosis, this wall gets thicker. So the air exchange doesn't happen as, as easily as it, is used, it happens in an unaffected lung. So air is black. So a chest x-ray, you should you look like this. So all black because it's filled with air. But if there's advanced pulmonary fibrosis, the chest x-ray looks like that. Basically, the walls of the lung air sacs have thickened, and then you see this whitishness. How do we diagnose lung fibrosis? Let's talk about first diagnosis, then I will talk about monitor. Interstitial, if, if there is one slide you should pay attention to during, throughout my talk is this one slide, is the most important slide. Uh, interstitial lung involvement in systemic sclerosis occurs early in the disease course. Therefore, monitoring for presence of interstitial lung disease or presence of pulmonary fibrosis should be performed early on. You don't want to lose time. Because once the fibrosis happens, it's very difficult to revert the fibrosis. You want to prevent the fibrosis. Chest X-ray or pulmonary function tests are not sensitive enough to identify presence of interstitial lung disease early on. 
The test that should be ordered is a high resolution chest CT, which is a chest CT that does thin cuts. So it, it enables a really good view of the alveolar space or the air sacs in the lung. It is typically without contrast, so you shouldn't be concerned if you have um, contrast allergies. And it should be done in prone and supine position. You should be lying on your back and on your belly when this test is done. Reason being is, when you are lying on your stomach, you take a deep breath. If you had some alveoli or air spaces that not, were not filled when you were lying on your back, when you are on your stomach, they, they get filled with air, so they're not being mistaken for fibrosis. So it's really important to do this test in both positions. But the report would say if you have lung involvement, it's called ground glass opacity, which is a haziness. It's not black anymore. Or it's interstitial uh, markings that are increased, that means like the, the walls are thickened, or bronchiectasis, these are uh, basically when the air sacs uh, become fibrotic and get thicker, they pull on the airways. When they pull on the airways, the air, airways become a little bit wider, that's bronchiectasis. And then when it is, there is more advanced disease, there's honeycombing. What is important in to remember on, on scardamma lung is scardamma lungs goes more to the lower parts of the lung. So if you have only involvement in the upper part of the lung and nothing in the lower parts of the lung, you have to think about other diagnoses such as silicosis, such as infection, other things that would cause more lung involvement in the upper. So please remember, high-resolution chest CT is better than chest X-ray to diagnose pulmonary fibrosis. What you will see is this haziness. Do you see how it is hazy and not black? That is ground glass opacity. That's the typical lung finding of early scardamma. Honeycombing can happen. It's like, do you see it looks like honeycombs here? Uh, not all scleroderma patients develop that, and that's more advanced disease as well. Pulmonary function test. Why do we order pulmonary function test when I went out of my way to explain that high-resolution chest CT should be done and not pulmonary function test to diagnose um, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis? Pulmonary function test is excellent to monitor progression of disease to understand where you are starting, how much you are worsening over time, is the single best test. Obviously, it has to be done reliably. If you're coughing a lot, it's hard to do it. If you cannot uh, uh, seal that pipe where you're blowing the air out, that's then it will give you unreliable results. Often, it is helpful to go to the same facility to do pulmonary function tests, because different machines give you different readings as well. The, the value we pay attention to is forced vital capacity. That's the single best value in scleroderma. We also pay attention to DLCO. FVC is basically you take a deep breath and then breathe out. And whatever you are breathing out, the volume is measured and, and your volume is compared to your age, gender, ethnicity, height matched controls. Uh, and and a ratio is calculated. If you are above that 80%, you are considered to have normal lung value. If you are be below that 80%, you are considered to have abnormal lung value. The other lung volume we follow is DLCO, which is uh, diffusing capacity of lung for carbon monoxide. It's the amount of blood in small lung vessels. Um, FVC and DLC are both reduced in pulmonary fibrosis, but FVC is more reliable measure of lung fibrosis. While lung, by pulmonary function test is not sensitive for diagnosing um, lung fibrosis, 
it is the modality of choice for monitoring fibrosis, for monitoring disease progression. So why do we monitor? This is the reason why we monitor. This is, uh, several of you are in the, this cohort study based in, in Houston. It's called Genesis cohort. Every single line is a scardamma patient. And this is called a spaghetti plot because I see these are look like spaghettis. And as you can see, scardamma patients, these are all patients with early scardamma, less than five years, start at different time points and have a very variable course. But the general trend is downward. But some people go downward a little bit, like these guys. Some people start here, go fast there. It's hard to see because the, but it's highly variable. And we want to know how the patient is progressing. And the best way of doing that is obtaining serial pulmonary function tests. This is another um, measurement in the Genesis cohort, which is the observational cohort based in UT Houston. Around 30% of patients have 5% decline in their FVC in the first year, whereas only 16% had 10% decline. And that, as you can see, not all the patients behave similarly. So what are the risk factors for having rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease versus a less progressive interstitial lung disease? Um, so if you have antitopo isomerase 1 positivity, you are at risk for developing more progressive ILD. African-American ethnicity uh, is a risk factor. Having a high CRP, which is a general inflammatory marker, is a risk factor. Male gender is a risk factor. Antitopo isomerase positivity is a risk factor, but if patients are treated um, aggressively, it looks like that is not a risk factor for progression if the patients are treated early on and aggressively. That's, these are our recent data from Scardemo Long Study 2. That tells me if you have antitopo isomerase positivity, if you are not treated, you will have progressive lung disease. But if you are treated, um, you have good chances of preserving uh, your lung volume. What is protective or less progressive ILD is antisentromere positivity. Another piece of information that is extremely valuable is basically what has happened in the previous year. So if you have had 15 years of scardamma, regardless whether you had diffuse or limited, but have only lost, let's say 10 or 15% of lung volume, it's very long, unlikely that you will lose more lung volume in the future. So what has happened in the past is a good predictor of what happens in the future, especially if you have a long period of time. I'm not just talking about one year, because sometimes people don't progress in one year and then progress next year. But if you have, for example, information over five years, and you know the patient has been stable over five years, that is really helpful information. So, so far I have given you a brief overview on scardamma and diagnosis of um, pulmonary fibrosis. Next, I will switch gears and talk about pulmonary arterial hypertension. So I will start with, with a typical presentation for pulmonary arterial hypertension. 65-year-old woman with 15-year history of systemic scardamma or systemic sclerosis goes to her rheumatologist because she has developed progressive shortness of breath with physical activity. She also has developed swelling in her legs. So her scardamma symptoms have been generally quiet. She was somebody who had really mild disease for 15 years, but now she has this shortness of breath, leg swelling. Um, she has some hypertension. She's a nifedipine and omeprazole for acid reflux disease. She has gained weight because she's accumulating fluid. Uh, 
she has no new areas of skin involvement. On exam, she has telangiectasias. Um, she has swelling in her legs. She has mild skin disease, only fingers, hands, and shins and feet. She, she has limited scleroderma. Her lung function is normal. Sorry, I, I apologize. Her kidney function is normal. She has anti-centromere antibodies. On, on her chest X-ray, we don't see any pulmonary fibrosis. It's basically the chest X-ray shows normal lung. PFDs show normal FEC but decreased DLCO. Basically, the amount of blood in the in the lung is decreased, but the lung volume in terms of taking a deep breath and breathing out is normal. Her echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of heart, shows normal ejection fraction, which basically tells you the heart is beating, the left heart is beating fine and pu putting out enough blood. But it shows also increased right ventricular systolic pressure. Basically, the pressures on the right side of the heart are increased. So what is the type of scleroderma this patient has? This patient has limited systemic scleroderma. What, can, what type of uh, lung disease does she have? She has pulmonary arterial hypertension. So what is pulmonary arterial hypertension? Um, she is increased pressures in the lung vessels without significant involvement of air sacs in the lung or any involvement of left heart. The left heart is beating fine. This, when the, the pressures are increased in the lung, the right heart has to work harder because it has to uh, generate more pressure to get the blood through the lung. So the, ultimately, this condition puts a strain on the right side of the heart. So this is a figure of pulmonary arterial hypertension. And I will try to explain it um, in a way that is hopefully understandable. So basically, the blood comes from the periphery, goes to the right side of the heart, right side of the heart, beats really, beats, uh, contracts, and pushes the blood into the lung. This is the lung, where it is oxygenated. It goes to the left side of the heart, and left side of the heart beats and pushes the heart, uh, pushes the blood out to the periphery to basically supply our limb, brain, kidney, with oxygen. Well, if, if the blood vessels here are narrowed, in the blood vessels in the, in the lung, let's see what happens. So imagine there is a city where there is a river in that city. There is this side of the river, and that's there's the other side of the river. I call this the left bank, and I call this the right bank of the river. Cars can go to the from the right bank to the left bank, crossing bridges. There are three bridges, and each of those three bridges have four lanes. No problem. Cars go from right bank to the left bank without any problems. There are a lot of bridges. There are a lot of lanes on those bridges. Now, something happens, let's say construction, and each bridge, instead of having four lanes, has only one lane. So what happens, the cars cannot get through easily. So there is, there is traffic. There, the cars get backed up on this side, on the right side. So that increases the pressure. So it's, it's hard to get the cars through because here 
the, the bridges, instead of having four lanes, have only one lane. That's what happens in pulmonary arterial hypertension. However, the most common cause for high pressures on the right side of the heart is actually problems with the left side of the heart. And that happens also in scotoma. Let's go back to our example with the cars. So again, there is a city, there is a river in between, and there are three bridges. And those three bridges have four lanes. And the cars try to cross from right bank to the left bank. There's no problem on the bridges. The cars can go through the bridges, get to the left bank, and, and just disperse throughout the city. But here, now there is a problem. Because on, on the left bank, which is here, there's construction. So there's a lot of road problems on this side. So the cars, af after they come through the bridge, hit traffic. So again, you have the same scenario where the cars get backed up. The cars get backed up, so the pressure increases on the right side because the pressure was increased there was traffic, there was increased pressure on the left side. That's how left side heart failure can lead to increased pressures on the right side. When the pressures on the right heart increase, there is edema. And when there is edema, um, when there is edema, we have increased uh, pressures through the uh, heart, right heart, which uh, leads to blood getting backed up, causing edema, and that can be in the belly that some patients have fluid in their stomach area or in the legs. However, it's important to note that this left heart problem can have two reasons. Either the left heart is not beating enough, we call it systolic pressure, when the ejection fraction goes down. That can happen, for example, if there's coronary artery disease or even scotoma lung disease. But there is actually a more common condition, which happens also common in scotoma, where the left side is actually beating well, but it can't relax. Because in order to suck the blood from the lungs into the left heart, the left heart needs to relax so that the blood can gush in. But if the left heart doesn't relax and the blood cannot gush in, then we will have, again, the same issue with the backed up. So the left-sided heart failure can be systolic or diastolic. Systolic is, is not beating well. Diastolic is, is not relaxing well. So how do we diagnose pulmonary artery hypertension? The, the screening test for pulmonary artery hypertension is an ultrasound of the heart called echocardiogram. What do we pay attention to? We pay attention to ejection fraction to look for left-sided heart failure. It should be more than 50%. We look for right ventricular systolic pressure, which is an indicator of the pressure on the right side of the heart. We look for Diastolic impairment, that's the condition where the heart is stiff and cannot relax to suck in the blood from the lung. Echocardiogram is only a screening test and should not be the last test done for diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension. The best test for confirming and actually also diagnosing um, pulmonary artery hypertension is the right heart catheterization. It sounds a little bit scary, but it's actually a very safe procedure. So the catheter is put through the groin um, or the neck, and they go measure pressures on the right side of the heart uh, with some very fancy catheters to understand whether the pressures are up. And when the pressures are up, whether the, this Increased pressure is due to pulmonary arteries being narrowed, that's pulmonary hypertension, 
or it's due to blood getting backed up from the left side. So in summary, pulmonary arterial hypertension is high pressures in the right heart and lung without left heart failure, without systolic failure, without diastolic failure, or significant pulmonary fibrosis. Obviously, if you have significant pulmonary fibrosis, you can have also some increased pressures um, in your blood vessels because the architecture of the blood vessels is, uh, is affected. So the cause for pulmonary arterial hypertension is thickening of lung vessel walls, not thickening of the air sacs. The air sacs are fine, just the vessel walls are, are getting narrowed in terms of lumen. Is that, that bridge that instead of having four lanes has now one lane. And that which leads to increased resistance in the lung vessels, which gets, leads to blood getting backed up on the right side, causing, for example, edema. So stay healthy, and I'm going to take your questions from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Asasi, very much. We're going to bring Misty Chapman and Jason Delancey on, and they're going to summarize the questions that have been asked during your presentation. Um, can I close my presentation? Uh, you can. It'll just show a blank screen afterwards, but yes, you could absolutely do that. Okay, then I can I can just leave it on there. Okay. 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 So I see Misty on here and Jason. You're a little bit dark, Jason. We can't see you very well, but I think that's okay because I'm sure we'll be able to hear you really well. So I'm going to close my camera and my microphone. I don't think I've introduced Jason yet, um, so I want to introduce him. Jason is a member of our board of directors. He is our treasurer, and Misty Chapman is also a member of our Texas. We bought a chapter board of directors. She's the vice president. So I haven't introduced myself this half of the day. So I am Diane Lee. I'm president of the Texas Blue Bonnet chapter. So we're all happy to be here and to be presenting and so happy to hear this Dr. Sussie very, very clear presentation. Okay, I'm going to step out. Hi, Dr. Sussie. Hello. So, so glad you could join us today. Thank you so um, much. Hi, Jason. Our first question um, for you is, is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis a sclerodermic manifestation? Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a different disease. By definition, it can't be scleroderma because idiopathic means we don't know what caused the pulmonary fibrosis. So these are two different diseases. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is not an autoimmune condition. It is um, typically affects elderly, like above the age of 60, and is strongly associated with smoking, has a more rapidly progressive course than scleroderma interstitial lung disease. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Um, what does air trapping on PFTs mean? And is this something that, um, should be cause of concern? Air trapping, um, typically what we pay attention to is FVC itself. Air trapping can have many different causes, uh, including if there is some obstructive disease like an asthma type disease. Um, so the more reliable um, marker of what you should be attention to FVC is your forced vital capacity. And the most important thing is actually not the one-time measurement, is actually the repeated measurement. Air trapping is much more, um, is not as reliable marker. Thank you. Um, our next question is, can a patient have both limited and diffuse scleroderma? Excellent question. So typically, once you become diffuse, you're diffuse for the rest of your life. So the course of skin disease, the way it goes, it starts in the fingers and works itself up. So by definition, initially, if you hit, find the patient early on, the patient will have limited by definition. But it can work itself above the elbow and, and um, knees, then the patient who transitions from limited to diffuse. And 
scleroderma skin disease can get better over time. It can improve over time. And some people that had diffuse lose their skin thickening on their upper arm, thighs, chest, abdomen. So they become limited again. But we don't call those patients limited because once you have become diffuse, you stay diffuse despite the fact that your skin has loosened because it has implications in terms of internal organ involvement. Diffuse patients have more common internal organ involvement than limited patients. Both of them have systemic scleroderma. So please don't confuse limited with localized scleroderma. Thank you. Okay, I got a question here. I'm, um, Dr. Sasi, can you address coronary, coronary microvascular dysfunction, dysfunction as it relates to scleroderma? Um, what testing to diagnose this is possible, if any? What kind of um, narrowing? Can you, microvascular narrowing? What was uh, the question? Coronary microvascular dysfunction. Culvonary? Is it culvonary? Is it culvonary? Um, coronary. Coronary. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, sure. Um, that's a different topic. That is lung. My topic was lung, sorry, that, that's heart. So coronary artery involvement uh, is scardema heart disease. And scleroderma heart disease can have different manifestations. We already talked about one manifestation, which was diastolic dysfunction when the heart gets stiff. The other one, it can have fibrosis. Also, there is some data showing that scleroderma patients are more prone to have arteriosclerotic heart disease, which is basically what kills everybody else on earth, which is basically a heart attack type of. But also there is some data showing that there's some microvascular involvement, smaller vessels in, in scleroderma heart disease. The way to die, there's no way to diagnose it except for doing heart biopsies, which you do not want to have because you don't want anybody to take away a piece of your heart. Um, typically, they don't cause problem unless the bigger coronary arteries are involved, which is the macrovascular coronary artery involvement. Thank you. Dr. Sasi, what percentage of um, SSC ILD patients with 30% ILD progress to a more serious lung disease? So, it really depends on the subtype, but uh, I showed you the data. It's around, uh, if you have SCL70, you are much more likely to progress than uh, if you are not SCL70 positive. Um, for example, if you look, look across um, scleroderma patients, around 50% of them have um, clinically relevant scleroderma related lung fibrosis. And what proportion of them will have progressive disease? It really depends whether they are treated or not. The data on treatment are actually pretty promising. And I would say it looks like half have progressive, don't, the other half don't have with, with treatment. It would be unethical to have now do epidemiological studies with untreated Dr. Asasi, is it common to lose a lot of weight when you have pulmonary um, hypertension? Pulmonary hypertension typically causes actually fluid re uh, re retention and can cause actually weight gain, but it's not real weight gain, it's just fluid retention. Um, if you breathe hard in general, you lose weight because you're working harder. Uh, and also, uh, the other uh, component there to mention is uh, several of pulmonary arterial hypertension medications cause diarrhea. And when they cause diarrhea, patients lose weight. 
Um, another question, can you have a positive SCL70 and a positive anti-centromere? Exceedingly rare, uh, but it can happen. Can a patient have ILD and also develop PAH? Yes, that is very difficult to diagnose because you don't know whether the increased pulmonary hypertension is to loss of um, lung structure or architecture. Because if you have pulmonary fibrosis, by definition, you will lose some vessels. When you lose some vessels, there's some degree of uh, increase in pulmonary pressures. But if the increase in the pulmonary pressures is out of proportion to the degree of pulmonary fibrosis, then you have to think about pulmonary architecture. Yes, it happens. It takes a lot of finesse and experience to diagnose it. Dr. Sassi, uh, how safe is it to do a pulmonary function test in this time of the pandemic? So um, I would not go to a facility that uh, does not uh, do prior um, COVID testing. They should be doing prior COVID testing on everybody before you, they take you to the pulmonary function facility. I think by that, that is relatively safe. Now I, I'm going to bring in second topic. Hopefully, the vast majority of our patients in Texas will be vaccinated in coming weeks if they are not already done. If you are in process of getting vaccinated, honestly, I think you should wait, get your two doses of vaccine, wait for two weeks because that's when your immunity is complete, and then get your pulmonary function test. Because it's just risk medication. And if I, I was not asked that question, but most of others have been asked, is it safe to receive the vaccine? I think we have now enough data to say it is safe to receive the vaccine. Another question, does supplemental collagen have an effect on scleroderma? Not that we know. Um, one other question, can you talk a little bit about dysautonomia, sorry, I'm no, mispronouncing that, dysautonomia slash POTS, the symptoms are similar to pulmonary hypertension. So dysautonomy of it is it's not clearly associated with scleroderma. And this autonomy happens in different parts of the body and it's not well understood. So, but it shouldn't give you increased pressures on right heart cat. Okay, doctor. Can high levels of CP CPK and aldolase be relative to scleroderma? If so, how? So these are muscle enzymes, and and a lot of scleroderma patients have some degree of muscle enzyme uh, elevation, especially if you get a lot of diffuse skin disease. There might be also some fibrosis in the lung tissue, so that can lead to increased, slightly increased CPK and aldolase elevation. But if it is really high, let's say three times the upper limit of normal, then you have to need to worry about a different condition, which is called myositis, which is inflammation in the, in the muscles. And, and that is uh, a dangerous condition, needs to be treated, and is associated with scardama. And the reason why it is dangerous is if you let that inflammation go unchecked, untreated, you lose a lot of muscle mass. And the muscle cells you lose, you don't regain. So you have to treat it. The question is, is that elevation really, really high or is it just borderline high? A little bit of CT elevation also happens with exercise. Dr. Asasi, I have one more question about the COVID um, vaccine. We've been getting quite a few of those. Um, someone wanted to know, while there's not enough data to know if the COVID-19 vaccine is safe for scleroderma patients, would you still recommend that um, those of us with scleroderma get it? I think we know short term we are, it's safe. I would have not answered it the same way two months ago. 
I mean, just in our own clinic, we have now hundreds of patients who have received it. We are trying to get the, the remainder of the hundreds vaccinated. It's just like we are bargaining with our administrators, please give it to our scarlet patients. We are just having a hard time. But it looks like it will be widely available in coming months. So nobody who is wanting to be vaccinated uh, should have problems getting the vaccine. And at least in our hands, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, these are the two that we have ex experience with, are similar. So basically take whatever you get. And by the way, all my faculty members are vaccinated and we all have children. And, and if we were worried that this vaccine will do something bad to us, we would not have taken it. And we took it in December where nobody else had, I mean, we had data from clinical trials, but we didn't have large uh, scale population data. Now we have data on millions and millions of people. We have one last question. Um, someone said, I know we're not talking about treatment for PHA, but what is the best treatment in its early stage? So you're gonna have a, an entire talk in the next hour about so I'm not going to steal somebody's thunder. That sounds like a good time to transition. Thank you very much, Dr. Asasi. And for delving into other areas that aren't just specifically associated, related to your talk today. So, but there are so many questions. So I appreciate you kind of going outside the bounds of your talk and talking about heart and talking about muscle and other areas too. So thank you. Very informative. This is so enlightening because it's a little bit confusing about all the different types of one scleroderma between limited and local and linear and and two between the different types of lung involvement so thank you for giving us a really clear definition of that it's very helpful so i'm really grateful to be having participated in the panel i'm really grateful to dan for organizing this and everybody else for for the questions misty and jason and the patients thank you so much